Thank you all again so much for being here today um, for this Life After Rice Careers in Sustainability. Um, my name is Alexa Schwartz. I'm a staff member at the Office of Alumni Relations. And in, in my role, I help connect um, students and alumni together for opportunities for career development um, through um, things like the Sally Portal platform as well as the Life After Rice series. And so these um, Life After Rice panels help showcase some of our incredible alumni um, in a variety of career paths. And um, we really appreciate the opportunity to share their expertise and share advice to um, members of the Rice community. Um, and so I'd like to pass it over to um, our moderator, Richard Johnson. Um, I will be um, helping to serve as tech support. As you've seen, that the session will be recorded um, and we'll be sharing that link after um, the session's over. Um, I, I forgot to mention, you can always send messages in the chat and we will be collecting questions through the Q&A features. Um, so feel free to send questions to panelists as well. Um, lastly, um, after the session's over, there will be a survey um, that will pop up in your browser when the webinar is over. We would really appreciate your feedback. It's helping us develop even more virtual programming for the future. I think that's all the housekeeping on my end. Um, so Richard, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, and greetings from Rice University. Um, we are at already over 100 participants, making this, I believe, probably the largest gathering ever of Rice environmental professionals and students with environmental interest. So, hooray. Uh, we are really pleased to have you. Uh, I'm hoping that this can become a regular thing. And I really appreciate there's so many of you who have already reached out to me on uh, email or LinkedIn. There's a Sustainability at Rice LinkedIn group that I encourage you to join if you're not part of already. So you can connect with, um, with other Rice uh, students and alums who are um, interested in the environment in some way. So I'm the Sustainability Director at Rice. I've been here since 2004. I graduated from Rice in 1992, Will Rice College. Um, went to graduate school at the University of Virginia in urban environmental planning, 1997. Um, started working here at Rice in 2004 as the sustainability director. I'm also the co-director of the environmental studies program. Um, and so uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of familiar uh, names here already. Uh, one person who I work very closely with is, is on, on the call with us, and that's Ashley Fitzpatrick. And I would like for her to give a quick introduction. She's one of our student environmental leaders and she's been an intern in my office. And as, as I always say, Ashley makes everything better that she works on. So Ashley, could you please um, give a quick introduction to yourself and to the Rice Environmental Society that you chair? Hi everyone, my name is Ashley. So I'm a dual degree in environmental science and anthropology. I am the president for the upcoming year for Rice Environmental Society, which is our parent organization that unites all of our eco environmental clubs on campus. So we're essentially like a group of all of the club leaders. And this upcoming year will be very interesting for us because of COVID, but we're hoping that um, we'll be able to continue to support environmental initiatives and promote more virtual events like this one throughout the semester. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I have really appreciated your help in, um, in planning for this event. I also want to thank um, uh, two more undergraduates, Kelsey Evans and Amy Rausch. I've, I've seen both, both of their names pop up on the chat, um, but they were also very helpful in putting this event together. And so I just want to uh, say hi to both of you and I hope you're doing well. If you hear thunder in the background, it's because we're getting this really big storm coming through Houston right now. So everyone who's not in Houston, please keep that in mind. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Alexa and our Office of Development Alumni Relations for putting this together. Uh, Alexa, thank you so much. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, in a moment, ask our panelists to um, take a moment to introduce themselves um, and then I'll ask a few questions to get us started and then we will take questions from the audience. So please be thinking about what you might like to, uh, to ask of and learn from our panelists. Um, to provide some context, Rice student interest in 
the environment is, is soaring. And it's certainly um, higher than, than I've ever experienced in my many years here at Rice. Uh, there was a survey in 2019 of all the undergraduate students um, in the fall. Two thirds of the respondents um, said that sustainability is important or very important to Rice's mission, 70% to their own educational experience. And get this, 80%, four out of five, said uh, it's uh, very important or important to their own personal future. Meanwhile, over 100 faculty from across the campus have coalesced around the issue of environment, and which has led to the creation of a working group um, uh, chartered by our provost office uh, to help uh, guide Rice's future with respect to teaching and research in the environment. So this is now mainstream. We finally got there, everyone. Um, yet for, for many of you on this call, including our panelists, you might have felt like the pursuit of a green career was anything but mainstream when you, uh, when you started. Um, and in fact, you might have felt like you were taking a bit of a risk. Um, so I'd like uh, for our panelists, let's hear about how you got to where you are now, um, starting with your, your time at Rice, and, and can you walk us through your career progression? Um, so let's start with uh, Bruckner. And I've asked each panelist to take maybe about three minutes in doing this. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here. And, and probably one of the things I would have expected least of all when I was graduating from Rice back in, in 1990. I swam at Rice for a couple of years and then went on to a professional career in the corporate world in private sector, working in project management and brand and retail development for companies like Abercrombie and Fitch, West Marine, and uh, Performance Bicycle. And it was the sustainability and connection to the environment, part of it was always something that was a personal practice, but didn't really become a professional passion until later in life. And I had always pursued a lot of endurance events throughout my time at Rice and then beyond that, that took me to oceans and mountains around the country and around the world. And in 2010, I did a really long swim across a, a marine sanctuary, Monterey Bay, that's part of NOAA's marine protected areas. And when I stood up on the beach to help launch an international film festival and share stories of what was going on in this amazing sanctuary and protected area, the impact was enormous and we saw or I saw the opportunity and kind of felt the calling that there was an opportunity and a purpose to help connect other people to the ocean and how our community and individual behavior changes and can positively or negatively impact that. So I launched um, a foundation leaving my private career behind and began working first with NOAA National Marine Sanctuaries, traveling to other marine protected areas, doing outreach both around the science and environmental side of it, and more recently partnering with NOAA and the National Weather Service to fold the safety message into it. Because as we encourage people to make personal connections to our natural waters around us, we feel there's an opportunity to make sure they do it safely so they can do it again and again. And so it's been a very um, interesting path to get here still always core and purpose driven, but uh, came at it from private sector and about as private as you can get. So it's really an honor to be here with everyone. Thank you so much, so much Bruckner. Um, Rachel, could you go next, please? Yeah, so uh, Richard, you were right when you said it, it's a very different feeling now in terms of uh, environmental issues and studies and concern at Rice than it was when we were in school. Um, I remember taking biology classes and realizing pretty quickly that it was a whole bunch of pre-meds and not people interested in the birds and wiggly things and plants and yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's very different. Um, so uh, I actually studied, ended up studying art and art history after I realized that biology wasn't the right place for me if I was interested in environmental issues. And so, uh, my senior project in uh, my art major in photography, I took photographs, abstract photographs of recyclable materials. So uh, who would have thought? Um, but uh, 
uh, after I graduated, I went and worked at a summer camp, which if you're still in school, I recommend it to everyone. Uh, um, people who have worked at summer camps hire summer camp counselors, former summer camp counselors, because they know they can have fun and sing really bad songs. Um, but if you work in summer camp and you want to work year round, you end up doing environmental education. So kids come and, well, uh, I think a lot of people have probably played in the woods with environmental educators. So I got into that, uh, ended up working at the Austin Nature and Science Center um, for several years. And then I moved to Houston, back to Houston. Um, and I worked for Mercer Arboretum, running their volunteer program, learned a lot about native plants, worked in Herman Park, which has changed a lot as well. And uh, I worked for the flood control district, trying to develop parks and trails and plant trees on flood control property. Um, and got to work with a lot of environmental organizations there. And then uh, after six years, I jumped over to the Houston Galveston Area Council, which is a super top secret level of government that nobody's ever heard of. And it's not intentional. Perhaps it's the exact opposite. They try very hard to let people know about themselves, but it's, they're woefully unsuccessful. Um, but I did water quality work there for the most part, also some flooding and parks. Um, yeah, and if you ever wanna know about the poo and the bayous in Houston, I know all about it. It's pretty gross. Um, but surprisingly, other things aren't as bad as you might think. And then seven years ago, I, um, I had been volunteering for the Citizens Environmental Coalition for nine years, um, getting their newsletter for years before that. And the, they were hiring an executive director, so I applied. So I've been here for over seven years. Um, and CEC is an alliance of about 150 groups that do environmental work in the Houston region. So we work with all of them, um, try and keep the environmental community connected. So it's a fun job. So in, in many ways, CEC is like a, a citywide version of Rice Environmental Society that Ashley Fitzpatrick leads. Um, instead of maybe a, a dozen or 15 or 20 organizations, it's way, way more than that. Uh, but speaking, you, you mentioned uh, plants and, and biology, and, and that connects our, our certainly our, our next two panelists. Um, uh, Claudia, let's, let's jump to you and talk about your progression to the Houston, Houston Botanic Garden. Hi, good afternoon. And yes, it is a progression similar to Bruckner. Um, well, I guess I'll start back at Rice. I was um, uh, at Rice in the 90s um, and um, had more like Bruckner of a personal passion towards um, the planet and all that thrives here. Um, and sort of maybe a little bit less, I did not take biology like Rachel. <laughs> um, but then um, after I graduated from Rice, I took a couple of years and um, worked in social service organizations and around the world before going to law school. Um, in law school, um, I was really interested in international social justice um, and took a couple of environmental law classes, both domestic and international, thinking that that could potentially be one area that I would be interested in. Um, really thought that I would be working um, in kind of the international legal world um, for a variety of reasons. One, including my husband, I ended up back here in Houston um, and uh, practiced law in a, a, a typical big law firm and then a smaller boutique. Uh, practiced law for almost a decade and spent my free time um, doing volunteering and being involved in nonprofits, um, sort of not as my professional career, but on the side. My heart was always in the social sector. So um, after my third child was born, I left the practice of private law and um, started working in the nonprofit sector. Um, I started working as an intentionally interim executive director of nonprofits, helping organizations in transition prepare for their next leader. Um, really focused on a lot of change management and organizational capacity building. And after working in a couple of different sectors, um, ended up at the Botanic Garden and started my career in sustainability and conservation. Um, well, it has always been something people ask me when I took the job, are you an environmentalist? And um, it was kind of one of those things that I think, you know, really changed over time. 
Um, but I kind of never really labeled myself, I would say, in that way. But when I started looking at sort of my daily practices and, you know, the way that we invested, my husband and I invested our time and our values, sort of said, no, actually, I, I think that word fits. <laughs> you know? um, so I've been now here at the Botanic Garden, and I see that we have a lot of people participating that are involved in um, land use or engineers and um, developing um, a garden and that um, this project that I've been a part of launching, taking it from we have a, um, a lease on a property but haven't done anything with it to designing it, um, watching the construction and implementing it, um, have had the privilege of interacting with a lot of people in, involved in this space um, in a lot of those different um, uh, career paths and professions as well and it's been a real joy for me to see how much action there is going on and how relevant the issue is and how um, sort of what you're reflecting Richard that's happening at Rice to see people's um, opinions and thoughts and values change um, and this becoming a major priority um, and certainly you know the Rice students and some of the younger generations have have been really active in leading some of that that's been really um, amazing so Claudia, thank you so much. Um, Randy, uh, you're next, and I just want to say I've, I've had the pleasure to work with Randy when she was an undergraduate. She was uh, an environmental leader in many ways, including in our EcoRep program. So Randy, it's wonderful to see you again. Um, so please tell us about your uh, progression. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, so I am a 2014 graduate of Bryce. I was at Brown College, uh, BSWP. Um, and at Rice, I studied ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, going into Rice, I knew that I loved biology. It was kind of the thing that I excelled at in high school. And I took an insect ecology class with Tom Miller my, first, my freshman year. And from there, I just fell in love with insects, just became a bug girl. Um, and so I worked in Tom Miller's lab really throughout my experience at Rice. Um, I did quite a few uh, like summer research programs. Um, for those of you that are still at Rice or entering Rice, definitely look into the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program um, for, it's a research experience for undergraduates. Um, so I did a few of those and I think I, I realized, oh, I just wanna get into academia. I wanna do science all the time. Um, so after Rice, I got my master's at a and in entomology. And during that process, I realized actually the classes that I like now are wildlife management and environmental permitting and kind of that macro scale renewable energy. Um, so I kind of kept that in mind, but I ended up going to uh, Wyoming to do some plant research with the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and that was an incredible experience. I kind of lived out of my car for six months, uh, just camped and looked at plants, got a big into botany. Um, and then from there, I kind of realized I maybe need a more like stationary health insurance kind of job. So I came back to Houston still with that kind of environmental sustainable career in mind. And I did a bit of environmental consulting um, with a couple companies in Houston. Uh, most recently, um, prior to my current job, I was with a renewable energy environmental consulting company. And that was really the first time that I got to do some hands-on work with wind and solar. And it just, it felt like the future, um, still feels like the future. And so I uh, transitioned into the development side. So I'm currently working as an environmental affairs associate at ConnectGen, which is a renewable energy developer with its uh, headquarters here in Houston. Um, on a day-to-day, -day, I do a lot of kind of the micro-siting, uh, gathering information to best uh, have wind, solar, battery storage um, have a minimal impact to, to the environment. And so, yeah, that's, that's my story to date. Um, yeah, excited to talk with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I can certainly, you know, one thing that I'm not hearing in, um, in these descriptions is a really clear cut linear path. Um, and I think a, a lot of students, they, they, they think that there's going to be this straight line, this logical line that leads out of their undergraduate experience into their careers. And I, I went, so I, I'm gonna share a secret with you all. I started my career as a highway engineer, um, uh, but rebelled against myself, went into water and sewer, then urban planning, I worked in a sustainable business environment for a while, back to urban planning and now sustainability director. 
But what I want to kind of um, maybe get reactions from our panelists is I, I think actually in particular with environmental careers, the unconventional path is quite conventional. It's, it's sort of the, the norm. Um, uh, do you all feel the, the, the same way? Uh, any, any reactions to that notion? Bruckner? I, um. I think that um, those graduating in the last 10 to 15 years might be able to find a more linear path into environmental studies. I know that um, it was not really a, a career path or a career choice that would have been that prevalent or discussed when I was there. But I also know that when you need solutions that are outside the box, Often, if you are completely linear in your process of getting there, you may not be able to offer the solutions and the creative problem solving that um, some of the environmental work needs today. Um, and I think that maybe it, it encourages that kind of circuitous um, path because of the outside the box thinking that we kind of need to have right now. Do others want to weigh in as well? <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, so one thing that I wanted to ask then is how have you seen this green career space evolve during your career? And Bruckner, you, you, you've kind of started that conversation with, with, with your re, uh, response. Um, so what's, what's, what's different now and what's changing? Even, uh, uh, you know, even just within the last few years, I've argued think, uh, things have really changed. But what, what, if, what, if you, are, what have you, are you seeing that's different now? I can chime in a little bit from, um, and I'll speak a little bit from my, when I was practicing law in the companies that we worked with a little bit lesser than the Botanic Garden. Um, but um, I, I really think that as this field has uh, transitioned and emerged, um, you know, it, it's going through the same phase that a lot of issues like this go through where um, companies will initially sort of have a token person um, that might be, you know, oh yeah, we're making efforts in this, but they don't really have much influence in what's going on. Um, and as I progressed in um, kind of what I saw transitioning with companies is that those voices became a lot stronger and, um, and people really started listening and, um, and, and valuing that perspective as something that's really important. Now, we still have a lot of work to do, um, but I do think that there is um, more of a recognition that this isn't something just to give lip service to, um, but it is something that is really important. And um, the, the questions that all companies are facing kind of that are looking at the longer game, um, that it's really important. So um, I have definitely seen um, that transition. Anyone else want to speak to what, what's, what's changed? I'll say one thing real quick. I mean, I had a professional career in retail development, and I recently attended a trade show for the surf and water sports industry called Surf Expo, and where you would you might have had a recycling bin at an office, or you might have had a token effort, like Claudia referenced, um, sustainability and repurposing of ocean plastics, of uh, carbon footprints, the way that they are manufacturing stuff. That wasn't a side booth at this recent expo. That was a prevalent primary conversation. And a lot of companies, um, the ones that are, there's, there's a focus now to be part of that. Some are kind of greenwashing and it's not really embedded in the culture, but some are really taking actions that are making positive impacts in their immediate community and then well beyond and really not just um, talking about something but embedding it in the culture and I, I see far more of that now it was really encouraging to be um, at that expo in January and see how predominant that type of conversation and those actions have become uh, so and Rachel I'm gonna put you on the spot here um, yeah you know we're here in the Petro Metro as Steven Kleinberg I believe ha has, has called it um, are you seeing this even here in the heart of oil and gas country here in Houston? Uh, well, the one thing that's kind of special about Houston, I mean, it, it's been a long time since I moved from Austin to here, but at the time it was easier to find a job and you could get paid more um, working in the environmental community than you could in Austin. And what I've also found is that there is a tremendous opportunity to make a difference here in Houston. 
I've known several people who've moved off to Portland, Oregon, and then have come back. Like, I couldn't get a job, and you know, almost everything was done. There's so much you can do here in Houston. There's so much influence that we can have. It's tremendous, it's exciting, it's invigorating, and it's exciting to me to see young people moving into those companies, the big petrochemical processing companies, um, and trying to change things from the inside. So, um, so yeah, that, there's a new generation that's really excited about making change and they're willing to do it from the inside, which is great. So uh, that, that logic was actually part of why I decided to be an urban planner in Houston as opposed to applying to Portland. Uh, I felt like this was an opportunity rich environment, if you will. Um, Randy, I wanna direct the next question to you. Um, one thing that I hear all the time from, from students, and I think it's starting to pop up in the Q&A as well, I encourage all of you to start putting questions in the Q&A. Um, what would you advise um, students to do who are uh, currently at Rice and want to get into some sort of uh, green career? You're, you're five or six years into it now. As you look back, what would you say to, um, to undergraduates? Um, I would say definitely look into in internships. Uh, just kind of take advantage of your summers. I think when I was at Rice, there was definitely this mindset, at least in ecology and evolutionary biology at EEB, there, there was this mindset of kind of academia or, um, you know, maybe some very small offshoots that you can find yourself in. Uh, so I guess renewable energy wasn't really a thing that I had in mind. Um, I just thought the engineers are covering that. It's not for me. Um, so I, I guess I would suggest Houston in particular has headquarters of like quite a few renewable energy development organizations um, and they have internships that are open every summer. Um, I'd say look into that. I would say uh, definitely look into the NSF GRSP, which I mentioned earlier, um, so you can get more experience really across the US in different sciences related to sustainability. Um, I would also say just be, be sure to look outside your major for opportunities. Um, I think it sounds obviously like this is changing and I'm so excited that this, um, you know, everyone is getting a bit more excited about sustainable careers. But I think that you can get different ideas from, you know, taking an engineering course or taking a sociology course or, you know, urban planning. Um, just, just putting your fingers in everything so you see all the different routes that you could take. So we have internships, we, we have um, thinking across major, majors and, and taking classes outside of, of your major. Um, Claudia, Rachel Bruckner, anything else that you would add um, for advice for our undergraduate students? So uh, when I work with the, as many interns as I can, um, which is sometimes too many, but uh, and Rice ones I'm always excited about. But I look for students who are not necessarily studying the environmental issues at school. Um, I will look for political science, uh, policy, engineering, business, communications, English majors. I don't look for environmental studies students. Every once in a while they'll show up and it's happening more often, but nonprofits especially need a lot of skills. Um, that aren't necessarily things you're going to learn in an environmental science program. So you, you might not learn about accounting, but every single environmental nonprofit needs to do accounting. So there, there are other ways to get involved, and I expect it's the same way in the big corporations as well. Can, can we talk about the, oh, okay, Bruckner, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll add, I've, I've seen a couple of questions pop up recently about the path to transition into sustainability or socially conscious fields that may not be, you know, coming from something outside of a, a traditional STEAM education. And in my experience in, in working in different areas around the world, that there really needs to be a, a larger social science lens applied to a lot of this. My wife is a PhD uh, from Penn. She's actually joining us from the living room right now. Um, she's a social scientist that actually helps NOAA and National Weather Service and how they shape some of their messaging to be cognizant of where certain communities are starting from and where they may need to go. Um, so I think that to look at sustainability and energy purely through the science lens is not recognizing the breadth of what needs to be there. Um, a rice swimming friend of mine is a CFO for a small startup. 
who's now looking at joining a foundation in, in DC as their CFO. So like Rachel said, um, business is business and people need to do a myriad of different things to move the bar forward. So I, I wanna talk about, um, uh, about skills. Um, uh, Rachel, you, you, you mentioned um, things that might surprise people like accounting, especially when you're in a nonprofit environment. Um, I, I knew a guy who started up a, um, a kayak company called Walden Paddlers and he said, hey, I'm the founder and CEO and I also clean the bathroom, right? So you have to literally do everything. But what skills in particular um, uh, and kinds of experiences, um, skill sets, do you think that students should focus on developing that maybe there's not a particular class on it, but that you think is, is essential to be um, a successful professional um, but especially in the environmental arena. So uh, the things that I really like to see in interns are curiosity. Um, I don't want interns who expect me to feed everything to them, but if I throw something out there, they take it and go off and discover things that maybe I don't know. That's really exciting for me. Uh, obviously, um, being self-motivated is really helpful. Um, like I said, it's kind of the same thing. I don't want to have to tell interns everything they have to do, uh, um, but provide feedback. Um, a lot of them will come to me and say, hey, you know what, can I apply for a grant? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, and that sort of, that initiative is really exciting. Um, uh, and then writing. I, uh, if you can't write well, uh, don't make, send me your resume because it's not going to be good. But usually it's not an issue Will with my students. Underline the importance of writing, please. Writing, writing, <laughs> writing, 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 all caps, <laughs> underlined. Does everyone hear that? And I would jump in and just say communication generally, um, especially in a field like this that needs stronger voices and needs compelling voices. And there are lots of reasons why people don't want to hear what's um, what the messages are and um, whether it's I, it, written communication is, I'm going to continue to emphasize that for you, Richard, because <laughs> it is true, um, but also um, verbal communication and um, being able to synthesize thoughts and, um, and also gauge your audience and understand the people that you're talking to um, is really important. So yeah, um, I would oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to add that um, one of the things that served me very well is over the last several years, I've, I've gotten really good at being comfortable being extremely uncomfortable, landing mm -hmm. in environments that are very foreign to what I would have been in before, whether it's um, being somewhere where no one else is speaking English, everyone looks and acts very differently from what I would have grown up around in Tennessee or in Texas. Mm. Yet these are critical communities that we want to have engaged and involved in some of the environmental or socially sustainable practices that we want. So practice being in situations and environments that are foreign to you and being able to recognize and listen before you just start preaching and talking. So um, Alexa, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pose a question or two that is from the Q&A section. So whatever is getting the most upvotes, um, please do that. Um, uh, one thing, so this is the therapy moment of the session. Um, when I find that when I am at conferences with fellow sustainability officers, we don't talk about this um, on panels, but it's certainly something that comes up in the between the session chatter, which is always the most important conversation. Um, and that is that sometimes when you're in an environmental field, you, you feel like no matter how hard you work, it's not enough. Um, the problems can sometimes um, feel overwhelming, uh, no matter what you do, there's always something else. So um, do you experience this? And if, if so, how, how do you deal with it? I'm happy to start again. I, uh, it, is, it is daunting. I mean, we started with a mission statement that hopefully was going to kind of keep us in our lane for our foundation. Um, but as I've gotten pulled and asked to do stuff, um, I'm remotely teaching a class in Queensland in Australia this fall. Again, I've been working on that for a while. I 
I get pulled and asked to do so many different things and it is absolutely overwhelming. And when I throw in the time zone, I'm on a conference call at 10 o'clock at night. Um, I, I really have to make sure that I'm, I'm literally taking care of myself. I mean, you can only have a sustainable career if part of what you're sustaining is, is my own personal state of mind. And, you know, I, I lean on and my wife encourages me to really kind of take care of myself and us first. We have a, a mission as a lifeguard. You protect yourself first to save others. And I would say that that is a good approach to what we're talking about here as well. What a great response. Anyone else want to jump in on, on that one? Yeah, I think there was also a Q&A question that sort of was um, hinting at this. Uh, um, there's so much to do. Um, I think part of the idea is, you know, find the area that you can find your passion in and um, that you can really put yourself to. And, and a little bit of it is connect to others that are working in the other areas to know that there's good work happening. You know, Rachel's organization keeps us all informed about the many work, the great work and the many organizations that are doing things more broadly to relieve a little bit of that feeling that you need to be active in everything that's out there. Find your corner of the world. You know, the, 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 I think there's a story about the, all the fish are, been washed up on shore and the man's walking down the beach and he throws one in and somebody else asks, you know, why are you doing that? There's thousands of fish, you'll never save them all. But for this one, it's really important. And for this one, it means everything. So find your place that you can do something and feel good about it. And, um, and certainly all the self care that you know, Bruckner was talking about is really critical because there, there's always more to do. Right. I think I will also add, um, especially when you're starting out, and I'll say I'm still relatively young in the sustainable careers um, area, but I think there's definitely this pressure to say yes to everything and to try to do everything and learn everything and you know, be the best employee possible. And I think that also goes back to communication, um, you know, checking in with yourself, making sure that you are communicating your limits and your boundaries to your boss. Um, I think that's very important and something that you know, is a, a skill that you really work on in itself. Um, and hopefully you have someone that's conducive to those conversations. But if you don't, I, again, that goes back to kind of the self-care um, and just making sure that you're taking care of yourself and putting yourself first. The, one of the things that I look to a lot is, um, I mean, I've been doing this work in Houston for 20 years now, more than 20 years. And so what's, really keeps me going. There are projects that you start and people will come to me and they're like, why don't we have this? And I'm like, give it 20 years and it'll come up. It'll, it'll, it'll work it up, work itself out. Um, there are trails that are around Rice University bike trails. They were being planned in 1999. Um, actually, they were probably conceived of in 1990. 90. And so it's just taken that long for it to come to fruition. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. It takes a long time, longer than we might want to make these changes, but it's totally worth it. Um, and so, yeah, so that's one thing. We're working now, we might not see the fruits of our labor for decades, um, but it keeps me going. Small steps, we'll get there. Totally worth it indeed. Uh, Randy, it looks like the top voted question is directed to you. Um, what does the renewable energy consulting space look like in Houston? Is it a thriving scene? Do you see pressure from the dominant oil and gas industry? I, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I was trying to answer it a bit in chat, but definitely want to still stay engaged. Um, so I would say that the renewable energy consulting scene, consulting scene is definitely thriving. Um, some of the environmental, environmental consulting I did was in oil and gas previously. And I would say that that definitely had more of a fluctuation um, with you know, oil and gas success. And with renewable energy, I think there's definitely more of a, a bit more of a constant there. Um, since there are quite a few development companies that have either headquarters or at least office locations in Houston, they're, you know, where clients are, that's where consultants go. So there are, I could, not even begin to count the a number of environmental consulting firms, engineering firms, um, you know, civil engineering firms that we contract on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so yes, yeah, definitely, absolutely thriving. Oh, and is there competition kind of with oil and gas? 
I would say no, I, I haven't felt that um, in the past you know, four years that I've been in this industry. I think that we definitely have our, our, our kind of spaces that we're working with um, and renewable energy generally can work pretty well with oil and gas, um, you know, whether they're sited near each other or really even, you know, over top of one another. So, yeah, I don't feel like there's any um, you know, strong push and pull there. In, in fact, it's, it seems um, the line between the two is increasingly blurred here in Houston. Um, okay, so the next question comes from Zoe Parker. Hey, Zoe, are any of you members of professional organizations? What organizations would you recommend to young professionals just starting in the field? I will give a quick plug for uh, women in renewable industries and sustainable energy. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's RISE with a W. Um, and it is women friendly, but not you know, women exclusive uh, or people that identify as women. Um, it is an organization for young and old professionals um, that have very kind of networking opportunities that are a little less, I guess for me, they feel a bit more um, conducive to really sharing ideas collaborative, collaboratively. Um, I was at a conference for RISE recently where we had a, a, you know, a room of 800 people that were kind of meditating together. It's like, oh, I've never had this happen at a conference. This is great. I love it. Um, and they have a lot of opportunities for uh, people in college, also people in high school um, that are interested in uh, sustainable careers. Um, and I think there are a number of other um, renewable energy organizations, conferences that, that have similar opportunities. Thank you. Anyone else want to uh, offer thoughts on um, professional organizations? Okay, so uh, another question. Um, do you all have any advice for individuals who are already in the energy industry, oil and gas, who are ready to focus more on sustainable energies, so solar, wind, et cetera? So uh, advice for somebody who's looking for um, a career pivot or transition. I can speak a little bit generally toward um, to a career pivot and um, maybe a little bit less specifically about how to get engaged in renewables from oil and gas. But when I decided to leave uh, private practice of law and move into the social sector, uh, the most important thing that I did um, really was networking. And it's um, hard to overemphasize the importance of networking. So really just reaching out to the people that were in the field um, like Bruckner said, with an open mind and listening before preaching and just understanding what um, the issues are, where the gaps are, um, what opportunities there are, um, while at the same time expressing interest and passion um, and you know, mining networks. And you know, certainly a, a shout out to CDC and Sallyport and the Rice Network. There's lots of ways to get connected. Um, I, one thing that I can certainly brag on Houston for if this is coming from folks in the Houston area is I do think that Houston, the people in Houston are incredibly generous with their time. And I have never had anybody who was not willing to give me a bit of their time to hear about what they're doing, where they are. So don't be nervous, even if you feel like you're cold calling to reach out and, um, and, and connect to people. So, so let, let's dive into that topic of networking for, for a moment. What specific networking tips would you give to students? What do you find is the most successful type of networking when, when someone is networking with you or when you are networking? I, um, let me just say one thing, and this is uh, kind of back to the communication. I have people reach out all the time. They kind of see the trappings of what we do and they want some insight into what it looks like on the back end, behind the curtain and stuff. And I will often, you know, give them a lot of information back and respond and send them links and everything. One of the best things you can do if you're trying to network is recognize the time that that professor or that expert or that mentor spent to send you that email and let them know that you got it and just tell them thanks. Um, I think that 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 network building is a two way street and make sure you recognize that because most of us are going to be very gracious with our time and everything. And it's nice to also 
hear how that advice might have landed in the short and long term. So as you network to kind of get that personal involvement with others and build the strength of that network connection, um, make sure you recognize it should be a, a two-way exchange. Absolutely. And I, I want to underscore the importance of the thank you letter, especially if it's handwritten. It really makes an impression. Other specific uh, uh, networking um, tips, for Rachel or Claudia or Randy? Yeah, other than the follow-up, which I think is incredibly important, and in part because if somebody has spent that time investing in you, um, they are likely someone who will do that again in the future at another time. And, um, and that's uh, really important to not just get the immediate answer, but kind of building that potential long-term relationship. Uh, one thing that worked out a lot really well for me when I was also looking into my career transition was when I spoke with somebody who um, had great advice and was willing to give me time was also asking them who else or where else I should go and what else I should explore. And um, I was able to get some really incredible connections um, through people um, who were uh, who could see what I was really interested in, what my passion was, and they then connected me to others that um, all that have many of whom have turned into be great um, relationships uh, professionally for me thereafter. So the, the I guess from please go ahead. Oh, um, I was going to kind of chime in. I, I think I guess in my view they're kind of two different facets of, facets of networking. There's the kind of networking where you pinpoint someone that can get you something and you maybe cold call them or reach out to them or go to a space where they're going to be. Um, and then there's also the kind of networking I think that happens a bit more organically, um, whether you're in classes or you know, conferences or meetings or you know, at the gym where you form networks with people um, that can, you know, maybe five years down the road or 10 years down the road, uh, give you an opportunity. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's important to, at least for me, the, the networking aspect, the hardest part for me is keeping in touch. Um, I think it's super easy to hand out your, you know, card to everyone and hope that they email you back. Um, but even, you know, having that awkward moment of like, hey, want to get coffee if you haven't talked to a person in six months or a year um, and just kind of trying to keep that relationship relatively fresh is, is important. Uh, thank you. And I also want to encourage those who are undergraduates um, or graduate students who are on the call um, to not be afraid to discuss um, careers and explore potential connections with faculty um, as well. Um, I, I know that there can sometimes be a, a sort of a, a, a feeling of being intimidated about having those kinds of conversations, but uh, uh, most faculty actually would really be pleased to have that conversation which, with you. It shows a genuine interest and um, faculty love students who are interested. Uh, Randy, you're getting a lot of questions here, so I'm going to direct the next one to you. Um, since Randy mentioned botanical research earlier in her career, um, I'm curious, what kinds of opportunities might exist with non-academic organizations in ecological or environmental research that are associated with efforts in sustainability? For example, U.S. government organizations like USDA, EPA. I think, I mean, at least for me, you named quite a few of the big ones. Um, USA Jobs is a huge wealth of knowledge just for getting ideas of what's out there. Um, I also think that Rachel, being in the nonprofit sector, could really speak to this um, probably better. I, I guess there are also some um, organizations that partner with, uh, like the USDA or EPA, um, like with the, the BLM work that I did was in conjunction with an organization called the Great Basin Institute. Um, I guess I would also urge anyone to look at job boards just to get ideas. I was constantly combing the Texas A&M job board just to better understand, like, do I want to be a ranch hand? Do I want to, you know, join the EPA? Kind of, yeah, just get the brain going. So there are a lot of uh, local initiatives. Um, uh, Katy Prairie Conservancy does bio blitzes on a regular basis, um, trying to develop, uh, uh, encourage the growth of native flora and fauna and eradicating the non-native ones. Uh, 
lots of organizations do work like that. Um, there are, uh, there's a growing number of land trusts working in the Houston area. And so they will purchase property or get an easement on the property to protect it in a natural state in perpetuity. Um, but a lot of times the agreement is that they have to maintain the property. Uh, if you just let it go, it'll, you'll end up with tallow trees left and right. Um, and so it won't be a native natural habitat at all. And so they'll hire people. When I worked at the flood control district, um, uh, we tried to plant native plants on thousands of acres. Um, and it was really difficult because we couldn't purchase. There weren't enough plants that you could purchase um, to put into at that scale. So they were working to try and develop ways to grow that capacity within the community. Um, uh, if they wanted native plants, they'd have to buy them from Florida or California, um, but there was no, that pretty na native, but not super native. Um, uh, so there are a lot of surveys happening, um, looking at how uh, native plant plantings will affect flooding. Um, I, I think there are lots of, lots of opportunities outside of the federal government. Um, and my recommendation is to just start getting involved. If that's something you want to do, you, you can usually do stuff like that on Saturdays and go help out either pulling out tallow trees or helping with a bird survey or, um, I don't know if, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, get iNaturalist on your phone. It's really fun. Um, and you can contribute to science just by going out and taking pictures of bugs. We love bugs. Um, and uh, plants and birds and whatever else you find out there. So, so start by volunteering and you'll find a community of people. Native Plant Society of Houston is very active and stuff like that. So that might be a good group to get involved in. And if it's appropriate for me to plug the Botanic Garden, we are certainly building our foundation of botanic research and um, we're, we're opening this fall, but we've already started doing some research. So um, we have some research and conservation projects in collaboration with a number of the partners that Rachel mentioned as well. Shameless. And I, I would say if you're looking at an organization that you, you know, love their mission and they don't have anything about volunteering or getting involved, do a cold call or a cold email like others have mentioned. Um, I've definitely had that pan out and, and it's great to just, you know, interact with, with someone in person. I want to do a quick time check with, with Alexa to see if it's okay if we, we go through a, a few more questions or, or when, when we need to wrap up. Alexa, are we doing okay so far? Yeah, I think we, we have time, I think, for one or two more questions and, uh, Uh, so I'll, I'll take a, a question here that is from Akash, and then I've got a final question that I'd like to ask everybody. Um, it sounds like Akash here is in the belly of the beast. He writes, what specifically has led to the change in corporate industry prioritization, I'm assuming, of, of sustainability? As an example, I feel like the firm I work at now still thinks of LID, so low impact development, it's a stormwater strategy, as a fad or unimportant to learn more about. I'm not sure how to change this. I don't have access to the information on market trends or typical client research that I could use for a more financially focused argument. I think we can, we can generalize that as saying, what if you are in a company that maybe doesn't seem to be taking this seriously, but you think you, you, you see where the, you know, where change is happening. Um, how do you go forward in, in that kind of setting? Help Akash out. Yeah, so I answered one of the questions that was similar to that as well. Um, and we were talking a little bit about communication and listening to your audience. At the end of the day, sadly, unfortunately, for a lot of these businesses, it's all about the dollars and um, money talks and um, the changes are, you know, people have good hearts, but at the end of the day, they're oftentimes driven by the dollars. So unfortunately, without access to some of those research, but I do think it is trying to understand who it is that you're talking with and what is it that, that they're focused on, whether it's because of their position in the company or their job, um, and then being able to take your issue and um, speak in those terms. So monetizing benefits and impacts 
um, there's a lot of work um, going out that's going on now where we can we can put um, kind of uh, more dollars onto um, the impacts of both bad actions and good actions for um, sustainability and um, that can usually open the door to kind of a bigger um, conversation um, when you start speaking the language of your audience and kind of understanding what their barriers are to the issue that you're trying to change. Thank you. And I'd like to add to that. I came from very much the corporate side of it and being able to flip sides of the table and say, look, I understand that you're responsible to investors. I understand that you're looking at a five-year ROI on this location you're trying to open and recognize as we try to move something forward in sustainability, conservation, or energy, that why someone wants to do it might be unique for what they're serving. If it's a CFO versus the human resources director versus the sustainability director, understanding where they're coming from and then having an understanding of where we need to be as far as that sustainability message. Doing a lot of work with NOAA, uh, we talk a lot about the blue economy and recognizing the significant financial impact of having healthy oceans and coastlines uh, in the billions of dollars. And so there is a lot of information available in both federal, local, and just looking at a you know, kind of a survey of what's being put out there that it is getting easier to monetize the value of some of the work that we're discussing. Thank you. And just a quick plug um, that there is definitely strength in numbers. I had a, I was in a very similar situation at my previous company, um, just feeling like no one cared about bugs. Um, and reaching out to other people, seeing if anyone is thinking about this, whether it's coworkers, you know, at your level or below you, and just starting that conversation. Um, and if you don't feel like there is a clear path to speaking with upper management, again, strength in, num strength in numbers. Yeah. I think this speaks to a lot of the skills that you all highlighted earlier, the importance of leaning into uncomfortable situations and uh, learning how to be persuasive in writing and in, in, in speaking um, uh, and many of the others that you have. Uh, before I ask the, the last question, Ashley, was there a, a, a question that, that you would like to, um, to ask? I want to give you an opportunity if, if you have something uh, on your mind. Um, I don't think so. I think a lot of good questions have already been asked. So, um, okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, I'm actually going to do one real lightning round question and then one that, that's going to be take a little bit longer. The lightning round is if there was one additional class or type of class that you wish you could have taken in your senior year before you graduated, what would it have been and why? Local government. Oh. Yes. Randy. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how that kind of ties into sustainability. Ooh, quick plug. We now have an environmental justice course at Rice. Those of you who are undergraduates, register for the fall. <laughs> Claudia. Um, that's a tough one. I, ooh, I can't, there are so many that I feel <laughs> like I would have liked to have taken. Um, I'll put another plug in for anything that allows you to get writing skills. Excellent. Bruckner. How to hit talking points when someone puts a camera in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> if, I could use that for, one. For, for the, <laughs> those of you who, are, um, who have not been to his website, um, I go to BrucknerChase.com and you'll see these videos where there's literally a wall of cameras as Bruckner emerges from a 25 mile swim across a body of water. Um, probably having been in the water for 14 hours. Yeah, and 14 and a half to, hours. Yeah. They're expecting him to be point on and he's probably just thinking, where's the bed? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the communications director was, was very pleased and he's like, we need you to do this in other places now. <laughs> okay, before I hand things back over to, um, to Alexa, um, I wanted to ask one final question of all of you. And that is uh, to just talk about something that excites you about the future. I am extremely excited to see the conversation around uh, the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how that is sustainable. Um, and 
yeah, just seeing companies talk about Black Lives Matter and, you know, having diverse employees and how to have those super awkward conversations is great. Um, and, and I think we definitely need more of it. So I, I would argue that this is actually going to really change sustainability programs over the, the coming uh, the coming years is 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 these conversations finally being uh, occurring together. Um, uh, Bruckner, the future. I'll say real quickly. I mean, one of the most encouraging things for me is also one of the most exhausting and challenging is as challenging as today's world is now with so many things hitting us. It is an unprecedented period of social revolution, and I feel that if those of us who are passionate about the areas in which all of us here are, are working, that there's an opportunity to see change in the next few years that never could have happened without the sparks that have been, been thrown into the, the social environment that we're in. And so I, as scary as so much of this can be, it is a tremendous opportunity for effective long lasting change. Claudia, and, and I also want, am hoping that, um, that you can tell us uh, when we can go visit the Botanic Garden, um, because it's one of the exciting things about the future here in Houston, but what, what are you excited about in the future? Yeah, so I am excited about opening the gates, and we are on schedule for that to happen uh, September 18th, so that people during this time will have another outdoor place to enjoy uh, plants and nature. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about the future um, as well is seeing how interconnected people that are spread so far apart are as well. So there's a lot of negatives to social media and so many other things, but I do think one of the positives, some of the, you know, sort of Randy said, the, the power in numbers, um, the way that people um, across the globe really can um, come together and work on these issues together, I think is really important. And it's really exciting to see how we can be connected to other people doing work and impact um, places um, that are not just local, but international as well. And th I, that's really exciting to me to see the whole world um, coming together. I'm really excited to see young people registering to vote and caring about the environment. Yay. Vote early, vote often. Well, vote often is actually a felony, but... Uh... Lots, there are lots of elections. You can vote off. Oh, not, not cast a ballot repeatedly in the same election, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, well, and so I will quickly say, um, you know, I have the benefit of interacting with uh, people in the age range of, say, 17 to 23 or 24 on a daily basis. And um, that is about the most uplifting thing that one can do. Um, and to see just the, the sheer increase in numbers of students who either want to pursue a career in sustainability or maybe they don't, but they recognize that it's important and that it's going to be part of what they do um, is, is it's, uh, it's really an exciting place to, to be. Um, this generation of, of, of students and those who have recently graduated are extraordinary and they are going to completely change everything and I can't wait. So with that, I really want to just personally th say thank you, first of all, to Ashley, Kelsey, and Amy to work, uh, for working with me and Alexa for um, putting this together and our fabulous panelists as well, Bruckner, Rachel, Randy, Claudia, um, it, it's, I'm really hoping that we can continue these kinds of series, hint, hint, Alexa. Um, so Alexa, with that, I want to turn it over to you and I want to thank you for helping to bring all of us together and for running this thing. Um, I'm, and just a shout out everyone again, you can connect with all of us on LinkedIn and you can go to the Sustainability at Rice LinkedIn page. Um, Alexa, maybe you can talk about Sally Portal as well. Yeah, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, for you know, being a part of this and for your incredible guiding of the discussion. Um, and also thank you to our, our panelists and students who've been involved. This was a great discussion. Um, I think the theme that has emerged through all of everyone's comments has been this importance of, of staying connected and, and mentorship and getting help. And, um, you know, Rice is here for you, whether you're about to start um, as a student in the fall, whether you, it's been 
20 years since you graduated, um, Rice is here for you as a resource. Um, and so I'd, I'd ask you to really, you know, take advantage of the Rice Network. Um, we have resources like Sally Portal, which is Rice's professional development and mentoring platform where you can get help and offer help to members of the Rice community. We have um, a great uh, upcoming, some upcoming series in the Life After Rice series. Um, in two weeks, we have the um, how to succeed in graduate school, and that's going to be a partnership with the Graduate Student Association and the Office of Graduate and Postdoc Studies. Um, so we'll we'll be sharing that information in the follow up. But really, uh, take advantage of the Rice Network. As you can see, there are so many incredible alumni that are willing to to share their their experience and advice. Um, um, so that's that's my piece of advice for y'all. Um, I would also just like to share a reminder that there will be an event survey. Um, after the the session ends so we'd really love your feedback any ideas you have for future sessions um and so on um ashley is there anything you'd like to share about race environmental society for any of the students that are on the call who'd like to get involved um i think most of our information can be found on our facebook page um sorry my dog is growling in the background um but yeah and we have a lot of different groups so i think if you're interested if you're an undergrad at rice and getting involved in any type of group res is a good place to start because we can kind of connect you to whichever specific group will best fit your interests so you can usually just message us on the facebook page and um either myself or amy who is our secretary treasurer for res will be able to respond to that and kind of direct people where needed our email is also on um, the facebook page um, Richard, anything you'd else you'd like to add about Administrative Center? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what else that I'll add. If, you, if you're just interested in learning more about what we're, what we're doing, you can go to sustainability.rice.edu. I think one of the most exciting projects that's going on is the uh, design of the new wing of Hanson College. Those of you who are Hansonites, um, it's a mass timber building, so if, uh, which is sort of the cutting edge of, of uh, sustainable design. So I, I encourage you to Google mass timber uh, uh, construction to learn more about it. Uh, but that project is underway right now. And the other thing that I'll say, everyone, please wear your mask and keep everybody safe. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> Everyone's got their masks. Um, Wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much, everyone who um, tuned in today. And again, thank you so much to our incredible panelists, students, and staff that have been involved with making this happen. Have a great rest of your day and yeah, stay safe and wear your mask. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.